Our next speaker is uh, Mark Victor uh, of the Libertarian Party of the U.S. Uh, he is running for election to the UN, U.S. Senate to represent Arizona. Uh, <clears throat> that's in November, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, he served in the U.S. Marine Corps from 1985 to 1992. His career experience includes working as a criminal defense attorney with offices in Arizona and Hawaii. He represents clients in the areas of criminal law, personal injury, civil rights, civil litigation, and mediation and arbitration. All attorneys working in his firm must pledge to promote freedom and a free society. Victor has been affiliated with the Live and Let Live Foundation, a topic that he's going to talk about today. Thank you for that introduction. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. So, back in 1992, over about 30 years ago now, I knew everything. I was a young whippersnapper heading to law school. I, uh, I was a Republican. I loved Rush Limbaugh. I liked Ronald Reagan. And uh, I entered law school and um, kind of ran into a speeding train called Professor Butler Schaefer. Show of hands, anybody here know Butler Schaefer? So Butler was my law professor, and uh, he challenged me to think differently. He uh, came into class on the first day and said, I'm an anarchist. I thought, what's an anarchist? He said, call me Butler. That's my first name. If you're not comfortable with that and you need the formality of law school, call me God. And I thought, this guy's going to be interesting. So I wound up, I wound up in his office almost every day after class starting with the same question. Hey, Butler, you know, if we didn't have the government do this, well, there'd be this huge problem that would result. And this was a problem I would be thinking about for hours and hours, and I'd discuss it with my friends. And Butler kind of let me stew in my very short-lived victory by saying, yeah, you're right. Seems like it'd be a big problem. And I thought, wow, so much for that. And then he said to me something I had never anticipated. He said, Mark, what do you think will happen next? I said, I don't know, probably this. And he said, what do you think will happen after that? I said, I don't know, probably that. And he said, what do you think would happen next? And I said, ah, he had, he had coaxed me into thinking my way through the problem to understanding that there's a free market, there's a voluntary solution to the problem that I was posing, which I would now phrase differently. Without being able to aggress against other people, how would we solve this problem? It was always some version of that. So he invited me to this supper club in LA. There was actually two of them, one called the H.L. Mencken Forum and one called the Knock Forum. And I thought, what the heck is a supper club? And I showed up and it was a group like this, really smart libertarians people who understood things. And although I was a big mouth in class, I sat in the corner and kept my mouth shut because um, I didn't know what to say. I was learning about a new philosophy. And um, one of these groups, they, they had a speaker every time, and uh, one of these groups, they had this guy coming in, Professor Walter Block. Here came this young whippersnapper, economics professor, talking about this crazy book, Defending the Undefendable. And I was enamored by this guy right then and there. I, I couldn't believe what I was listening to. He defended the most reprehensible people you could ever imagine. If you haven't read his book, Defending the Undefendable, you should get it and read it. Maybe read it twice and really understand how he worked his way through those problems. So I just want to say for me, personally, what an honor it is for me to follow Professor Walter Block, someone who I've admired and followed over the years, a great libertarian thinker, someone I'm, uh, I'm just uh, honored to know and I've been uh, fortunate to keep in touch with and discuss all these hard questions. 
But so I'm on fire in 1992. And I've been on fire ever since. And there's one question that's been burning inside of me that I haven't been able to figure out. Why the hell are we in the minority? Are you kidding me? Here's a conference on capitalism and morality in Vancouver. People come from all over the place. And there's not 100,000 people here? How can this be? We're obviously right. I don't need to spend time talking to you guys about the moral case for not aggressing. I don't need to talk to you about the practical case, what results. I mean, do we care about things like freedom and peace and prosperity, raising standards of living? And if we care about that stuff, we have an overwhelming argument here. Why are we in the minority? This has been puzzling me for all these years. And so I've been thinking about it as a criminal defense lawyer thinks about closing argument in front of the jury. It's funny, I get these young lawyers who I train now and they come in and they say, Mark, the cop's lying. I say, yeah, seems like the cop's lying. Do we need to convince the jury that the cop's lying in order for us to win the case? If the answer is yes, then let's beat the crap out of that cop and show he's lying. But if the answer is no, I don't care about that. Because some people might think the cop's still telling the truth. And I don't want to lose the case over something that doesn't matter. So I've been thinking about what is it that we need to do better? Because if they understood our message, if they understood it, they'd be with us. They don't understand our message. That's the problem. They don't get what we're saying. And you know who's at fault? We are. We're at fault for that. And I want to be the first to plead guilty because the young Mark Victor coming out of law school would have approached you with something like, you know, meth should be legal, right? In fact, I wrote an article, legalize methamphetamine with an exclamation point after it, probably about 20, 25 years ago. People said, Mark, you know, maybe you should change the title. Should we end the drug war, question mark? I said, nah, legalize methamphetamine, exclamation point. I might have also said, screw the government, is my first statement to you. Or taxes or theft, more accurately, robbery. But you know what I've noticed? They don't listen to us when we lead with that stuff. You guys all know this. They don't, when you say we don't need government for anything, I'm an anarchist. They say, oh, okay, and they're done. We have got to present differently. We gotta start with the principle. It seems to me at least half of the libertarians have never heard of the non-aggression principle. That's the one thing that binds us together. Why don't we start with that? Do you know how many libertarians I speak to and say, Tell me what your thoughts are about the non-aggression principle. They say, huh, what's that? I listened to Joe Jorgensen when she came to Arizona a few years back when she was running for president. In fact, I got to introduce her in Arizona. I listened to her for an hour and a half. She never once mentioned the principle, not once. She threw out a bunch of issues and that's how people select things, right? Oh, I like these issues. I'll be a Republican. Or I like these issues, I'll be a Democrat. If we sell them on the principle, they understand everything. Why don't we lead with the principle? And okay, when you do lead with the non-aggression principle, as I do, as I used to, I speak to the gun community in Arizona. Nobody is more well-known as a pro-gun lawyer in the state of Arizona. Maybe one of the most pro-gun places in the entire world than me. I speak at the gun shows for 25 years, and if I talk to them and tell them about the non-aggression principle, the first thing they're gonna say is, ah, no, we like self-defense. They say, wait, 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 we're not ruling out self, it's about non-aggression, it's about initiation of force. I've already lost them. They don't know what the hell I'm talking about, they don't care. We got to convince people of two things. Number one, 
There's this non-aggression principle and you should accept it. You should agree with it. And number two, it applies to everybody. Even if you form a little group, even if we get together and we, we make a nice name for our group and we wear a funny hat or put a badge on and get a title, don't care. We got to reason consistently with that. It applies to all people, all groups, all corporations, and damn it, the government. If you can convince people of those two things, we're done. That's really all we have got to convince people. We have got to get them to see those two things. The nap is too esoteric. What makes sense? Start with the wind at your back. Live and let live. They already agree with this phrase. Try it. Next time you meet somebody, they know nothing about your politics, you know nothing about theirs, whether they're talking about Trudeau or Biden or Russia or whatever they're talking about, try this. Say, hey, you know, look, I'm just a live and let live kind of guy. For me, in 100% of the cases, the other person has said, yeah, me too. I'm for live and let live too. I'm still waiting for the person who's gonna say, no, I don't like live and let live. I don't like that phrase. Oh, really? Is it the live part you're against or the let live part you're against? That's gonna be a fun discussion for about 60 seconds. I don't need to get everybody, so I'm not wasting more than 60 seconds on that conversation. There are things we libertarians could do better. We could act more professionally, right? I mean, sure, you get to dress however you like, you get to speak however you like, but there are some ways of communicating that are more persuasive to the vast numbers of people than other ways of presenting. Like for example, when you drop your pants on stage at the National Libertarian Convention, which is what happened in the United States a few years back. You have every right to do that, I suppose, as long as the property owner doesn't have any issue with it. But this isn't the most persuasive way to communicate. I suggest we should be more persuasive. Why do you think aggression is wrong? Is it because you're for natural rights or you're social contractarian? or Jesus told you, or the Quran says, or Professor Walter Block said, or Ayn Rand said, or economics, or some other, I don't care. And neither should you, for purposes of changing the world. Why on earth are we arguing about what, what roots, what anchors our position on aggression? It's a fun discussion to have if you're in my backyard sometime, love to have it with you, I agree for multiple reasons that aggression is wrong. But we shouldn't be arguing about this. If they say, I think aggression is wrong, we should say, welcome to the club. If you really mean it. Implementation questions, hard questions, like abortion. We don't agree on that question. There are ways to deal with things that are hard questions and implementation. Can we get agreement on the principle before we lose them on how the nuances of how we're gonna implement that? People don't agree on abortion. I rather like a lot of the things that Professor Block said here today, but there are many places to attack. There are many places to disagree, right? In the law, I won't go into them. Might we just say, look, in certain hard questions, we're reasonable minds who are already committed to our principle and are trying the best to implement it. If those people disagree, let's put that decision in the local community, not the state, the city, the town. Let's let them resolve it within a range of reasonable choices. What's good about that? We can now let economics take over. You don't like that rule? Move to the next town. You don't like that rule? Don't do business with this town. Easy, low transaction cost ways to let the market decide which of the hard rules at the edges. 
If we come out as a pro-life movement, we're going to lose everybody on the pro-choice side and vice versa. I don't want to lose people. We have got a planet and a species to save. This is no longer a fun discussion. We need action. We need to win this argument, which we can and will win if we focus on the right thing. Do you agree that aggression is wrong? What's aggression? It's the initiation of force against another person or their property. It's fraud. It's coercion. It's doing anything that puts another person, I'll say it as a lawyer for a moment, at a substantial risk of harm. You might say doing anything that puts another person or their property in danger. That's aggression. You don't get to do that. We got a great argument here. Most people, when confronted with that question, almost all people, they agree with us. Why aren't we presenting it in that format? There are also transition disputes. Okay, Mark, I'm sold on this. Taxes are theft. Taxes violate the rule. Now what? Do we eliminate them in one swoop? Do we gradually lower them? Let's not fight about this. Reasonable minds disagree here. We libertarians need to stop fragmenting ourselves into different groups over small little issues like implementation, like transition. We need to get them to agree on the principle right now. How do you advocate for this? Should I vote? Should I not vote? Don't worry about that. Different things apply to different people. Whatever you got in the tank to try to convince people, more power to you. I'm not asking anybody to vote for me. If I get in the debate, I don't care what they're talking about. When they come to me, I'm talking about the new global peace movement called Live and Let Live. I'm going to tell you about it in just a second. I don't want to debate anarchy versus minarchy. It's not that different of an argument at the end of the day. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be negative about things. I don't want the baggage of the losertarians. I'm a live and let live guy. I'm for live and let live. I wish I was running as an independent, not even as a libertarian. And it pains me to say that. We have screwed up our movement because it comes with baggage now that I don't want to get in a fight over dispelling them of. So we have two rules in the Live and Let Live Global Peace Movement. Rule number one, we call it our legal principle. I want every single law to be calibrated, to be in harmony with this principle. Don't be an aggressor. If you agree with that, we can also call you a libertarian. That's what libertarian is about. That's the sum total of libertarianism. Now for the really super smart libertarians like the ones in this room, I can already hear Walter thinking in his head, Mark, there's a theory of property underneath all of this. There is, but that's not where we're losing them. Most of them will agree they own themselves. We're not losing the argument there. Maybe some we are. We don't need everybody. We need more than we got. The American Revolution was maybe a third. We got the most productive of the people. We got the cooperators. We could probably make this happen with way less than a third. So if you don't get the don't be an aggressor thing after I've explained it to you, I'm moving on. But we libertarians have made an awful mistake by ending the discussion there. We gotta say more. Because we haven't said more, we've been less persuasive. So Live and Let Live is a peace movement, not a freedom movement. You can get freedom with compliance with rule number one. If we stop aggressing against other people, which is what the libertarians say, you get freedom. But we could still hate each other's guts. I could live next to Walter and say, F you, Block, I hate your position on whatever. He could say, F you, Mark, and I don't like your position. As long as we don't trespass, we're good libertarians, but we're damn sure not living at peace. 
We need something else. And we need this for two reasons. We need a moral role. The reason we need a moral role is so we can explain the critical difference between a legal rule and a moral rule. A legal rule, it's forced on you. Whether you agree with it or not, don't care. If you say, Mark, I never agreed to be an aggressor, I say, don't care. To the extent I can stop you, I will. To the extent we can make the law banning all aggression, we will. We don't need your permission, period. We want to impose that rule on everybody. But a moral rule is totally different. A moral rule, we got to inspire you to follow. And by having a moral rule, we have occasion to distinguish between the two things. What's our moral rule? Rule number two, the moral principle. How about be a good human? Be a good human. You can blow me off here and say, I don't care, Mark, but I want to convince you. What does it mean? You probably know what it means. Don't give me this, I got no idea what you're talking about stuff. Yeah, you do. But if you need some guidance, open-mindedness on everything. Be open-minded. Tolerance. Other people live differently. They look differently. They love differently. They eat different foods, celebrate different holidays. Can we tolerate them? We're pushing you to just tolerate them. How about voluntary kindness? You don't have to be kind. You shouldn't be forced to be kind, but you should still be kind. Voluntarily help others. How about civility? We have to call other people names. We have to act like jerks. Can we agree to disagree on those occasions when we do? Let's build high levels of trust with other human beings. Those are good relationships. I'm in favor of good relationships. The ones with the low trust, those are bad relationships. Want to have more influence in the world? Build high trust relationships. We care about truth, whatever it is, facts, wherever they go, rational inferences from those things, whatever they are, even if they're different than what I believe right now. Why do we care about any of this stuff? Let me be bold enough to tell you. We, in the Live and Let Live Global Peace Movement, we want to optimize human happiness and well-being, and we want to minimize suffering. Why do we want that? Because we want peace. We have got to get to peace. That's our moral principle. Live and let live, that phrase captures this very well. Live. You're in charge of your life. You're the iron-fisted dictator of you. Your body, your property, your money, your time, that's on you. Live however you want. Doesn't mean I can't make suggestions. I'm making them. That's rule number two. I suggest you be a good human. I'll make that pitch right out at the beginning. I'll put the moral principle right out there first. Boom. That gets them to listen to us. When I then say, let live. You know how you want to be the iron-fisted dictator of you? You decide what goes in your body? Afford other people the same rights. To let them live how they choose to live. I can say it all with that phrase. I can tell you what I don't discuss anymore. I don't discuss the size of government. Should we have it? Should we not have it? I don't care. As long as your government doesn't violate the aggression rule, I'm happy. I don't discuss capitalism or socialism anymore. What? Both have varieties that comply with rule number one. Voluntary capitalism, we call that free market capitalism. Capitalism that violates that rule, you might call crony capitalism. It's out for that reason. Socialism, same thing. You want to pool your money together and have a common bills with common people? Fine. No problem. Doesn't violate rule number one. You want to drag somebody into that against their will? It violates rule number one. It's out for that reason. I don't have to make a case that Walter could make. I'm not capable of making that case. I'm not an economist. I don't want to have to argue economic curves. If we got to argue that, we're going to lose because they don't understand that argument. But they can understand you don't get to violate rule number one. 
Think about the question that we libertarians get. Oh, so if somebody wants to run a restaurant and not serve Jews, can they do that? They could do that, right? Our answer is yes, that's right. The right to trade includes the right not to trade. Nobody's aggressing here. And then we, we quickly pivot to an economic argument, right? Well, he's gonna go out of business. Okay, maybe, that's a good argument, but you know how it leaves people if you've been in this position. Hmm, they don't love that, do they? It doesn't persuade people. I can now say something in addition to that. That guy who's running that restaurant, he's no live and let liver. Well, I defend his right to serve or not serve whoever he wants to serve. He's not part of our movement. We're pushing open-mindedness and tolerance and kindness towards others. He doesn't check box number two. So while we absolutely defend his right to do things we don't agree with, as long as he doesn't violate rule number one, he's not one of us. I don't feel I'm losing too many people here, by the way, at all. We need a new generation of people. I understand George Washington's argument in his farewell address, avoid entanglements. I get that. I understand Murray Rothbard. A lot of his arguments was your neighbor does this and that. I don't think these guys understood, and how could they, the world we're in right now. Threats against us sitting right here in this room can occur from anywhere in the world. We got nukes all over the place. We can't bury our heads in the sand any longer. Soon people will be able to make them, maybe in their garage over the weekend. Like every other technology, if somebody wants it, they're going to get it. If that day was today, that would be the end of the human species and maybe the planet. We got to do something about this. You think Corona was bad? I know the response to Corona was a disaster, but this will not be the last pandemic. We have synthetic biology coming. There are people in the world right now with horrible ideas in their head working on coming up with more communicable, more deadly viruses. These are threats to us right now that we have every right to deal with from wherever they occur around the world. We got artificial intelligence. We're not going to be the smartest things by a long shot at some point. I don't know how this is going to play out, neither do you. We got to deal with this. We got to make sure that this technology and other technologies are being developed in a way that doesn't kill everybody. We got to get jurisdiction around the world. We need a global movement. We trade globally. We fly globally. Corporations do business all over the place. We're not going back into the box. We can't put technology back. We can't just worry about our local communities any longer. We need to embrace globalism, a voluntary form of globalism, not arguing for an iron-fisted dictator global king here. And I think there are ways we can get there. I just don't have enough time to talk to it, to speak to this issue right now, because I, I don't want to run out of time. But I'm asking you to do something here. I'm asking you to help to be part of the solution. We need to reach out to non-libertarians. We need to get the average person who's ripe for the picking right now. There's never been a better time than right now. Don't be down about what's going on in the world. Be excited about it. It's our best opportunity we've ever had to do something, and I'll put it in quotes, new. Because for them, the new live and let live global peace movement is a new thing. For you, it's not so new. Rule number one, we've been talking about forever. Rule number two, be a good human. You probably have thought about this too. It's not so new. It's a new way to market our ideas. I'm asking you to help, to get involved, to be a live and let liver. The Republicans and the Democrats are in collapse. 
They don't know who they are anymore. Wheels are falling off. We can be there. We should step up right now to make it happen. Live and Let Live Foundation is now a nonprofit, 501c3 in the United States. You can make a tax deductible donation. We have global chapters all over the world. We have 10 countries just in Africa. They're excited in Africa right now. They're using this symbol that you see on my shirt. Most of you don't know what it is. It's the Hawaiian shaka. If you've gone to Hawaii, you know this symbol. Why are we using that? Because most people don't know what it is. And I don't want baggage from the peace symbol or any other symbol. This means aloha in Hawaii. It stands one of the many ways you can say the same principle that we're trying to promote here. The golden rule is another way to say it. You're in charge of you, I'm in charge of me is another way to say it. But the guys in Poland emailed me recently and said, Mark, the symbol, we didn't know what the heck it was. It took a little while to catch on. But then he sent me a picture of the chapter in Poland with all the guys going like this. We're living let livers now. They're excited. The group in Portugal, same thing. There are groups all over the world springing up. We're getting ready for a formal launch next year. We have global discussion groups. There's one going on right now that I'm supposed to be hosting, that our executive director is taking. We're, we started out with regional chapters, but we're turning into global Zoom meetings. Our goal is to run one every day. Someone in the world will log on. It may be our leader in Portugal, or one of the guys in Nigeria, spoken at their conferences now. Yeah, there's guys in Nigeria, men and women wearing this shirt, saying I'm a live and let live person. Part of our global peace movement. Go to our website liveandletlive.org. By the way, my political website, liveandletlivevolution.com. I'm intending to start a movement where people run all over the world in any party as live and let livers. I want them to all use the live and let live revolution.com website so they can see we're all saying the same thing then maybe jet off to their own personal website. We need to get the reasonable people of the world to get together and coalesce around two simple ideas. Don't be an aggressor and be a good human and understand the difference between those rules, the critical difference. One's mandatory, one's voluntary. Our website has lots of content. I'm writing a book. It's a much deeper dive. I talk about how we in the Live and Let Live movement would handle hard questions like abortion, like animal rights, like climate change, like pandemics. All of these things we discuss. And when I get to a spot where reasonable minds disagree, and there are many of them, we move on. We say, let the local community make that decision within a, within a reasonable realm of choices. Think about the question of what's a competent adult. We all say, yeah, competent adults are in charge of themselves. What the heck's a competent adult? I don't know, 18, 17, 16, 15, I don't know. But is it eight? No. We got a right to say, sorry, eight goes too far. But maybe we should tolerate 17, 60. Let the local community make that decision. We're working on conferences. We're working on a festival. The Live and Let Live Festival, I want it to be the best, coolest, most fun event in the entire world. Think Woodstock, Burning Man, Coachella, put together in a huge Freedom and Peace Festival. We're working on an international holiday, International Live and Let Live Day. Our goal, we need to win more hearts and minds. That's what the goal is. When there's more of us than there are of them, we will get our way. Right now, there's not. I'm asking you to join the movement. I'm asking you to and join the movement's easy. Go to liveandletlive.org, check the box that says, yeah, I agree with rule number one, I agree with rule number two. Great, you're a member of the movement. We'll keep you posted on what we're up to. Spread the message, blast it out on all your social media. 
Tell people about what it is that's going on here. Participate in the discussions. Donate money if you're in a position to donate money. Help us grow. We're still looking for the leaders of the movement. There are leaders in this room right here. That's why I'm speaking to the libertarians. You already understand rule number one. You agree with rule number two. And you're activists. And we need you. Anyways, I don't know if I have time for questions or not. I want to leave you with our sign-off with the Shaka in peace.